there are three types of AI engineers, right? There's the AI enhanced engineer, there's the AI product engineer, and then there's the non-human AI engineer. Sean Wang talks about how to go from software engineer to AI engineer and mental models for approaching AI literacy and skill building. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Modern One Podcast. Here today with uh, myself, Tracy. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady <laughs> and, Thanks for joining us, Tracy. Yes. And I'm joined by my co-host, Rob. Hey, everybody. I'm Rob Osell. I'm an architect at This Thought Labs. Yes. And then Sean. Uh, Sean's been on before, but um, Sean Wang, he is, you are now editor of Latent Space. If you haven't checked that out yet, is it latent.space as the website? Yeah, yeah, um, like the short domains. Yeah. Yes, and then the co-organizer of the AI engineering conference. Is it mm -hmm. AI.engineer? Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> Very Perfect. short. Oh, yeah. Easy, easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk um, about the origin, yeah. Yeah, and Sean, you, Sean's been on the podcast before, but I think you've been on when you were more, gosh, was it more svelte? I think I, th yeah. I think that was the last time we had you on, and now you have just yeah. like dived into this AI space, and we're so excited to have you. Yeah, so yeah, maybe for having maybe, me. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe start there. Like you know, obviously, if, if people might know you more from your from your Twitter account, Swix, S W Y X, and and you know, people who have been around for a long time remember you from your your building in public. Not that that's changed, but you, you know, you were one of the people that really made that catch fire uh, years back, and then. I remember the last time we were talking, it was a lot about the third age of JavaScript. And now you're huge yep. into the AI ecosystem. I was wondering maybe to start out to introduce yourself, can you kind of draw a through line to us? Like, do you see this as all evolutions of answering the same types of questions? Or what is it that kind of attracts you to each of these and that ultimately is sort of attracted you to the AI space? Yeah, um, that's a great framing and uh you have so you have really good context which we can talk about later uh tldr like spell kind of got boring um uh, third edge of javascript was mostly like proved correct so there's nothing left to prove um uh, so then you move on right like i mean i don't have to stay on the same thing forever uh, especially if it's like you know major like th part of the thesis of third edge of javascript was a few things like right react uh, front-end frameworks will become more compiled right so Svelte wasn't the leading edge of that and now react is built working on the compiler like yeah, did that, called that four years ago. I mean, what like what do I do? I, I, do I keep doing talks uh, with the same exact content? Like, no, like it's boring. Um, another thing was, um, you know, systems core uh, scripting shell, which is another part of the 30 JavaScript thesis. And now major parts of the JavaScript ecosystem and Python ecosystem are being re rewritten in Rust um, and like, do I keep making talks about that? No, like it's just it's just like work has to be done. Work is ongoing, um, and it, it'll happen. Like Tailwind's being rewritten in Rust. Um, Turbo Repo was originally Go, now rewritten in Rust. Um, things are happening, and you know, like it's not going to be um, the. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna play out incrementally over the next ten years by the people working on it, and you know I I think it's it's good enough for me to call attention to it, um, and it's good enough for the ecosystem to be aware that these are the big bets that you want to make. Um, these are all talks I've done um, for people who want to see it. You go to like the Reactathon I think twenty twenty two talk that I did, um, where I like laid out like you know where the where these, this all is going. Obviously AI is like on top of a lot of people's minds, including you guys's, um, and. Uh, my history with it comes actually from before I was in tech. I worked in, uh, I used to work as a trader in the derivatives desk, uh, in the currency derivatives desk of Standard Chartered in London. And I actually created an, um, my first NLP application, just taking in broker quotes. Um, and it was just natural language, like on the Bloomberg terminal, like quotes of options would come up and I wouldn't have to scan them and note them down and then price them. Um, and it was all this kind of very routine operation. So I effectively wrote my own app. And, and this was the first like real production language I, I learned, which was Haskell, not JavaScript, not Python. I learned Haskell first. Um, and I, I wrote an NLP application in Haskell to like, consume those broker quotes and spit out like option pricing, you know, like, uh, and, and we were traded billions and billions of dollars of options on the on on that app that i made um so like that was the state of nlp at the time like very very simple like entity recognition and um you know parsing of of, of, of text uh, but not really like intent not really uh, reasoning any of the stuff that we deal with now um i started stay, uh, i started late, late in space because stable diffusion came out and it was like so mind-blowing that i could run um that whole like 
basically all of sort of generative images on my laptop. And I thought that was really interesting. And then obviously ChatGPT blew everything up in 2022. Um, and then about a year ago, I started noticing that uh, there was a lot of demand for people building with AI who are not ML engineers. And I noticed this on two levels, like the demand side and the supply side of the labor market, right? Like um, on the supply side, obviously a lot of software engineers wanted to, to spend their nights and weekends doing stuff and things that people spend their nights and weekends doing tends to become their day jobs eventually, right? Like that's, that's, that's what they're really passionate about. And on the demand side, companies wanted to hire people that they saw on Twitter, like doing interesting things with AI, um, but they didn't, uh, one, they, there weren't enough of them. And two, they didn't have the traditional ML engineer background, right? They, they did not do uh, the PhD. They did not uh, have years of experience in data engineering. Uh, they did not, they don't even know PyTorch, but they know how to take foundation models and put them in applications and make money, get users, get a, a lot of attention, all of which are things that companies always, always, always want to do. Um, and so effectively I was like, all right, let's, let's put the label on this thing, uh, make it an industry. Uh, and I called it the AI engineer. Um, I wrote a post about it and I uh, bought the domain and I announced the conference. Um, and you know, like it, it was basically off to the races from day one because Andre Karpathy um, read it and, and basically it basically came out and endorsed it. He was like, there will be more AI engineers than ML engineers. It's just math. It's just like the law of demand and supply. So um, I think once I convinced him, I convinced everyone. So that was the, the, the start of the journey. So we know that you love when you find a topic that you like, you know, it kind of comes from your learning in public ethos, you voraciously devour as much information and context <laughs> and interesting opinions from people. So I made the observation sort of offhandedly to somebody else recently that I saw you as being one of the people probably as close to seemingly as close to the front edge of the I don't know if you want to call it the hype wave or the adoption curve <laughs> on some of this stuff as 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 many people there are. And I guess my question is, is what do you hope to use your position and influence to do. And to some extent, I think the AI engineer sort of world's fair maybe indicates that. Are you hoping to steer where the research goes? Are you hoping to steer where the, like that, to in, have an influence at that level? Are you hoping to just uh, help guide engineers? Like what are you hoping that your impact is kind of in this community? Or are you just knowledge for knowledge sake? Uh... Knowledge for knowledge sake is a worthy, worthy go, but I have found a cause that I believe in more strongly than that, which is very rare for me. Um, so yeah, I am hoping to create an industry, to create and legitimize the AI engineering industry. I've said, I've said this from the start. Um, I think I expect this to be a 10 year journey for me. Um, so no more hopping around uh, because I, uh, it, Unlike the other things that I've done, where I, you know, was uh, I ran the React subreddit, I started Svelte Society, I talked about the third age of JavaScript, I have been uh, developer relations in AWS and Temporal. Um, this time, like I'm like very very center of it, <laughs> and I, I have much more of a responsibility. Like people look to me for a lot more direction than uh, all the other roles combined, and so yeah, I mean, this time it's like kind of real. This time it's like all in. And um, uh, I, I do think like that, that my goal is to start an industry. I, I think that um, I, this thesis that I mapped out in the Rise of the AI Engineer post is correct. It's going to take 10 years to play out. And when you see it playing out, um, you will see what's in my head right now that doesn't exist, which is a fully legitimized AI engineer in the industry that um, people see on, this, on the same level as data engineer, DevOps engineer, uh, and to some extent, even front end engineer. I think AI engineer will do better than front end engineer, though. So, what is um, an AI engineer then? Yeah, right. Sure. Like, <laughs> I should probably should have a pad definition, right? Uh, <laughs> AI engineer is a software engineer that uh, specializes in working with the emerging AI stack. Uh, it is not, uh, you know, AI engineer is not a ML engineer or research scientist. Um, AI engineer often has the qualities and the backgrounds of a full stack engineer, uh, meaning front end and back end. Uh, but they don't, may not, uh, eventually may not even have web development experience. Uh, what they do need to have is complete familiarity with uh, all the tools and techniques that uh, is emerging in cutting edge uh, foundation model application, right? Like it's very much less research. You know, Rob, you mentioned like, am I hoping to affect research? Not really. You know, that, there are conferences for that. Um, 
it's it's much more about AI has now crossed the chasm from research to production, and that's where engineers shine. And so what I conceive of the AI engineer industry is is helping people take uh, foundation models, which which have a lot of raw latent potential in them, and specializing in them and deploying them to production for custom use cases to help people to make money, uh, all that good stuff. So um, that's the AI engineer. Um, if you if you see the rise of the AI engineer blog post, you see this kind of line, which really helps clarify it for most people. And there's a spectrum between uh, machine learning research and uh, the the end user in production. And, and so on the yeah. Well, just kind of breaking down AI engineer is that everywhere from building an LLM or an SLM to using you know, kind of like some of these APIs out there or is like building LLMs and SLMs like not part of being not an AI of. engineer. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's where it ends. Yeah, people, people typically say um, training and, and, you know, people typically say pre-training. So mm -hmm. um, AI engineering starts where pre-training ends, right? It's it's post-training. Um, um, it's And, and so uh, that's everything including, <clears throat> uh, you know, taking an API off the shelf, which uh, a lot of the, the top models are closed and proprietary and you can only work with APIs. Um, and that's fantastic. Like the, the closed labs love AI engineers because that's their target customer. Um, but also obviously everyone, people want, everyone wants control. So um, being able to self-host open source models is, is definitely part of the AI engineer curriculum and then being able to fine tune them as well. Uh, to have it, to have that degree of control, uh, but you do not need um, you know the the traditional PhD or um, ML engineer route to be productive with foundation models, and I think that's my main message and discovery over the past year. Are you seeing a demand in these types of engineers? I mean, I know I think before the podcast we talked about AI engineer job posts now being posted, but are you seeing people look for AI engineers? Uh, put it this way. Uh, uh, recently, I found, uh, I, I'm sharing this in the chat, I recently found that OpenAI just posted their first job posting for AI engineer. <laughs> like, it, they themselves are trying to hire this. And uh, yeah, there, there's demand all over. Uh, when I announced it, like, IBM was like, we're, hundred, we're hiring hundreds of AI engineers. Um, there's, like, all sorts of startups who come to me now. We, I mean, we, like, we really should set up a job board. Like, I just haven't got around to it. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, like, that's not the point. The point is to coin a handle that everyone understands is a short form for this set of skills that we want, this set of background that we want. And uh, that's what it, people call a shelling point, right? Like uh, where, you know, uncoordinated people will use this same terminology and same set of beliefs and same, um, you know, curriculum um, to refer to this, this, this rising industry. And like, that's how you start an industry. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think like it's, it's gotten some traction, like right now on Hacker News, I just saw like it's someone saying, how do I transition from software engineering to AI engineering? Um, and it's, it's a thing. Like, I think, uh, you know, what is, what is the win criteria? I think the win criteria is when like, it feels like a legitimate job because it doesn't right now. Um, it's definitely a small army of hackers all over the place. But mm -hmm. um, when you have the industry conference, the industry survey, like, you know, companies, you know, putting AI engineering on their landing page and then IPOing, then you have one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's definitely better branding than prompt engineer. I'll put it, uh, say that. Yeah, um, and there's a conscious choice between that. I went through a lot of candidates. Um, I actually listed the candidates um, on, on the original blog post. Um, the reason, uh, I, I would typically say prompt engineering is sold 2022 and AI engineering is sold 2023. Uh, we, we can discuss what 2024 is. <clears throat> but um, <laughs> uh, the reason you want to do AI engineering is that you um, want to use code to orchestrate um, LLMs. And that makes you so much more powerful than using natural language because LLMs are just not there yet. And we know how to scale software systems um, to, to billions of users, and we don't know how to scale LLMs to, to do most of the use cases that we actually wanted to do. Um, so you have to augment LLMs with code, and you know that's the domain of the software engineer. The, the research scientists and the machine learning engineers don't really care about that stuff. They just want to you know, improve their benchmarks and then serve their models. What is the, what is kind of your thought on the learning path for AI engineers? You know, I know like, you know, your pin tweet on your Twitter is this idea of long-term games of like thinking of systems yeah. and systemized thinking. So 
you know, on the one hand, every time you open up your browser, there's another announcement of another product launching that is <laughs> phenomenal and amazing. And I could see that for, for somebody that's just sort of trying to be a part of this, you can get caught up in this constantly playing with the latest toy, but never actually building anything or maybe not understanding how the pieces go together. So what is the way that people should approach learning to become an AI engineer kind of in this space? How, how do you sort of recommend that people uh, develop down this career path? Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I have a five part answer to this. <laughs> it's absurd. Okay, so first of all, um, what is core knowledge that that is required, right? Like, I think everyone should have some kind of curriculum that they would go through and go like, okay, now I'm like, at least kind of onboarded, I know what I don't know, instead of I don't know what I don't know. Uh, and for me, that is uh, Leighton Space University, LSU, to trigger the tigers. Um, it is uh, basically like a seven-day free email course where, like, I, I was like, okay, if if you had one hour a day for seven days, like, and you like talk to me to, to ask me my my recommendation, I would just send you to this thing because a lot of people ask me stuff, and um, it's my selection of like a like a survey, like like a little bit of this, little bit of that. Um, just enough to get you familiar and then also to give you more homework if you want to dive in dive in a little bit more um so that's a seven-day email course it it's, uh, starts with uh you know being familiar with completely familiar with the open ai apis because that's where uh 95 of people um you know run their production workloads um and then going into code generation into rag which we're going to talk about into multimodality with um, image generation and audio recognition uh open source models and fine tuning them and then ai agents like you'll you'll end the course building your own um, ai agents uh, but using the tooling that we developed over the past seven days um and that's a free course i think that's more of the public service just because people keep asking me where to start um that's the foundations right like those are things like you do not, you shouldn't start by, everyone will still tell, like a lot of people tell you like, start by re reading attention is all you need, 2017 um, Vaswani et al. And no, like <laughs> the people making millions right now with AI, like don't actually know transformers that well. Like they know how to use transformers. It's kind of like being like a, like a, like a race car driver or something and like needing to know like how the first Model T was designed by, by uh, Ford helpful but like very very little to do with like modern yeah very uh, low driving. efficiency on that yeah. <laughs> um i i mean i think i think the car analogy is like very stretched because obviously race car drivers do know a lot about cars um but but yeah i, I mean like uh when you drive a car do you know how a car do you need to know how a car was made no like <laughs> um you just need to know how to use it to, to get what you want done and i think that's what ai engineering is going to be like it's going to be less glamorous than ml engineering for sure but there's going to be way more people doing this than ml engineering because just there's a sure demand and supply issue going on okay so that's the first part it's just latent states university like the um the um how you get how you how you transition to an in industry you just uh you go through a course that someone else someone has picked you can go through my course you can go through the Andre Karpati course. You can go through Fast AI with Jeremy Howard. Both of those guys, obviously, I'm friendly with them and I, I look up to them a lot. They are much more focused on onboarding ML engineers because that's their backgrounds. Uh, they have more credibility because of that. Um, okay, so then the second part is like having just that immersing in the news flow. And how you want to do that is um, two ways. Uh, one is uh, you know, you want to immerse in like the newsletters and the, and the podcast that like tell you what to pay attention to. Um, so I happen to have one. It's late in space. Um, and, uh, it, and that's partially what I do as well. Like the, the whole learning in public thing, like I, I consume information, I spit it out and people give me feedback and then I get better as a result. And that's a positive virtual cycle. Um, I would I have a list of other peer podcasts that I look up to and admire and, and recommend. So you just search for my name and like good AI podcasts and newsletters, you'll see my list and you can follow that list as well. Um, so that's that's like the, the highly produced um, news flow that will keep you up to date and give you opinions that you can start using to, to learn about more current things than the stuff that was in the onboarding curriculum. That's the second part. The third part is, let's just call it like the daily news flow. Um, you do need to do something more than Twitter because Twitter has a lot of, um, let's just call it hype. Um, there's a lot of things where like someone will announce, I think exactly what you said, someone announced like, this is the biggest thing ever. And then a week later, they'll have completely forgotten about it. And that's a complete waste of time for you, right? Like, so um, you do want something where uh, there's a little bit more lasting 
criteria, but 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 you also have a, a good survey of like everything that everything important is going on. Uh, for that, I have AI News, which is a, a newsletter that has uh, which is a daily uh, AI newsletter that uh, surveys Discord, Twitter, and Reddit uh, for the best uh, sort of AI content. Uh, sorry. Best AI perspectives. Um, and you get really interesting stuff when you actually uh, combine all these things because people are very differently behaved on different platforms, and people really tell their honest thoughts on, on some platforms as well. Okay, then um, then you want to maybe. Uh, so I think that was that was like the the fourth one. Um, <laughs> I, I think the, the the fifth one is really like you want to get um, like if you only like if you only had like there's too much news going on you have a day job you're like you know I, I can't i can't get into any of this and if you only have one place to go once a year or once every uh, half a year um you should go to some kind of conference or some kind of um industry event. Uh, it could be mine it could be someone else's like neurips was very good for me um which is the sort of annual like machine learning um i guess the, the biggest research conference in machine learning. There's there's ICML and there's IC, iClear and all the others, but New Europe's I would consider the best in, in America, and um, uh, or you can come to mine, which is the AI engineer conference, right? And that's like twice a year now. Um, and so I think like that's the range of learning from like just onboarding to like daily like, high quality news flow to daily news flow to uh, once a year and like very uh, very high production value, very high bandwidth communication. So it's funny because like that lesson of how to get up to speed is really uh, centered on sort of universal concepts of being integrated into the community. But I could understand that being extremely relevant with AI, just with the pace of it all. That like you said, you, you need to be at these conferences because yeah, you can go to a conference for any technology, um, but like with AI, that's really where you're going to get, you're going to be hearing those kind of uh, curated people who are showcasing what's happening kind of on the front edge, on the, on the battleground, on the you know, out every day building products. And so I can imagine that being extremely high value information there. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I hope so. Uh, I, I learn a lot when I organize these things. Uh, and I think it's also very much about taste. Like we are definitely not the only AI conference, uh, but I would say we're, we're the AI conference that has the, has all the speakers that you actually want to see. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, I, I could go down the list, but also I don't want to turn this into like a, a sales pitch. I think I think it's very much just more about like um, you want to vary your learning sources, right? From like sure, sure. the the beginner friendly to like the throw into the deep end of the pool and just figure out how to swim, um, and then you want the like the the, the time uh, time consuming one where you want to go deep and and all that, and then you want the uh, maybe like the really con 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 concise, condensed version. Um, and I think there's a spectrum of, of content out there uh, for you to immerse. Um, obviously, don't forget, <laughs> like that's maybe only like half the equation. The other, the other half is also to get hands on, right? Like, a lot of the stuff I always say, like all my stuff is, is, is you know, ho has homework. I try to give homework to people so that they can get hands on because that's where you do the most learning. Yeah, so, and even with the oh, go ahead, Tracy. No, I just like, going back to like kind of like what you're supposed to learn, right? Like, I think the um, rag stack or rag is thrown around a lot, and I can't tell you how many vector database companies I see popping up twenty four seven. Um, oh, I did a count uh, oh, in twenty twenty three. In twenty twenty three, three hundred and twenty five million dollars of VC was thrown into vector databases, <laughs> which is it's, more than the entire entire. Uh, amount invested in MongoDB before IPO. Oh my goodness. And that's in the VC market, so. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think a lot of people are just kind of like throwing money at this right now. And, um, you know, I personally was like, what's the rag stack? So, you know, I built a little little app, you know, on the rag stack. Is that what you call it, on the rag stack or like using rag? Sure, it's there's no, no, there's no gatekeeping on that stuff, no. <laughs> call it whatever you want. Um, but then, you know, I, I guess, I guess the question is like, is that, is that it? Is there more? Where, yeah, there is where more. does that lie in, in, in kind of like the learning journey? Uh, yeah. So rag is very, very central. It will never go away. I, I will maybe like put my foot down and say like, stop talking about what is rag going to die or is what's after rag rag will rag is like eating your vegetables. Rag is like learning how to talk. Um, it is it is like a demonstration of core competency of any AI engineer. Uh, okay. It is days, but it it is still only days two and three of my seven day course. Right, mm -hmm. days four, five, six, seven. I like focus on everything else after we assume that you know Rag. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you are an AI engineer, you don't know Rag. You are not an AI engineer. I will say okay. that. Okay. Right. Well, what's so like, what's day yeah. three, four, five, six, 
<laughs> exactly. Um, so like uh, there's there's you know image generation, uh, there's um, uh, audio audio recognition and gen and speech generation. Those are you know the two biggest components of multimodality. There's code generation, which we can talk about, and then there's uh, open source models and fine tuning them, and finally uh, building your own AI agents. So all of which are like interesting dimensions that you can explore without doing RAG. Um, but I would say your education will be incomplete without uh, if you don't. Um, you know, deep dive into RAG. Uh, for those people who don't know about the Klarna example, definitely look into Klarna because uh, that's one example of like a very successful uh, RAG domain. Um, like many of the top AI startups are just RAG startups, right? Like um, it is, this sounds boring because RAG seems, sounds like a, such an such a unsexy name, um, but unsexy means money, like as, as I'm sure you guys well know. Um, so. That I'll, I'll make a plug for that, but we can talk about the other stuff if, if you want. We can talk code generation. I, I'm, I'm very into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, well, just generally what, when you when you talk about all the different things in your course, it sounds like you're just teaching people how to use the different APIs that are out there. And that's kind of um, what mm -hmm. Uh, you use APIs because they get you fast, but actually we have a, like about half the course is open source models. Um, mm -hmm. where you're not using APIs, you're running them locally on your own devices or whatever. Mm. Um, I mean, like APIs are a tool, right? Like I, I don't, they're kind of neutral. Like um, basically either you buy an API off of someone else or you have to make your own API, right? Like th there's no getting around APIs. Before we get back to our conversation, we wanted to say thank you to this.labs, who is the sponsor of today's show. If you need help with a project that has failed to deliver on time or are in need of a team that feels true ownership over your engineering projects, definitely hit up this.labs. They specialize in helping business leaders ensure their strategic digital initiatives stay on track. Trusted by companies like PlayStation, Capital One, Herman Miller, PayPal, and T-Mobile, you can find them at this.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Now, let's return to our show. Like, so I'm, I, I don't fear them. I don't want to live my life without them because, you know, I, I know that under the hood, like they're just interfaces between them parts of the application that I own and parts that I don't. So code generation, tell us more. Code generation is the one sort of recursive piece of AI engineering that I think will blow up AI engineering in, in a very, very major way in the sense that um, uh, I would recommend everyone read the Voyager paper from NVIDIA where they effectively showed how code generation in a very structured way with curriculum learning can improve the performance of AI agents way more than just raw foundation models on their own, acting on their own, like with GPT-4 and all that. Um, so you can beat GPT-4 and, and all these other top models by, it, um, by building up a skill library of generated code that you can then run again and again. Um, and I've, you know, my, my, my whole thing is, um, I, always, I always look for analogies and then pithy quotes. So I always call, I call this sort of LLM at the core of your application or code at the core of your application. So code core versus LLM core, right? LLM at the core is ChatGPT, right? Like um, you have a thin layer of like UI and then it's mostly calling the, the LLM. LLM gives you back whatever and you display it. That is what a lot of people think their job is. Um, it gets deeper with a rag stack in the middle where you, 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 you take some user input, you, you perform rag on it, you stick that in the context, and then you send it to the LLM and you, you still uh, have LLM at the core of the center. Um, and this, like, this is fine uh, until you start running into things that, where you want to do more complicated work, uh, like what uh, was achieved in the NVIDIA Voyager paper. And then you have to co sort of coordinate um, long series of actions. Um, and I think that's where you start running into like really, really challenging problems that can only be solved with uh, writing more code and generating more code. Um, and so like, don't like, basically, I, want, I just want to remind AI engineers, like, don't forget that you, like, like, because you're using AI, you don't have to generate all, you don't have to write all the code manually. That's a very sort of software 1.0 thinking. You don't have to machine learn all the code. That's software 2.0 thinking. Uh, software 3.0 is very much, um, how can you use AI to augment its own capabilities on demand to solve problems that, it, that arise as you, as you go? Um, and I think definitely the skill library approach is, is a key part of that. Um, I'm playing around with Devin right now, which is uh, very, very viral. Um, it's on the, like, the big tech alerts uh, Twitter list, which is like insane. Um, and uh, it, it is absolutely like the future of how I want to work. Like I always want to work with a Devin uh, uh, alongside me, alongside of a copilot, right? A copilot is very much um, inside of your sort of inner 
uh, developer workflow while your hands are on keyboard, Devin takes care of the stuff outside of my um, uh, developer workflow, which is um, asynchronously, the, I, you know, it's just operating on the task that I give it, and I can just check in on it every few hours. Interesting. You know, this is a bit of an aside, but obviously the, the Devon piece touched a nerve. And I know recently you've been uh, having, uh, doing some experimentation with, and other people have with AI agents that you can like talk to and like, Oh yeah. Um, personal AI. Yeah. Personal AIs and things like that, that you can just have conversations with and they can help with any number of things. There are camps out there, right? People will be AI maximalists or utopians or whatever. And then there's like the, the, the dooming side of it. I'm kind of curious if you put yourself anywhere on a spectrum that you would label, like, would you call yourself an AI utilitarian? Like, <laughs> because what I don't get from you is this, like you said, you've taken yourself somewhat out of the hype cycle. You're interested in hearing what's hype to see if it's, if it holds up, but like, you're not interested in learning these things purely for the sake of hyping something up. It seems like you're trying to find that value. So do you, do you put yourself on this or do you largely just try to avoid both sides of this? That uh, is the hype. Like <laughs> I, I do, I, I do lean on the more hypey side. Um, that's just cause I, I think there, there's just a lot to celebrate and you know, what a time to be alive. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't go full hype because I, I, I definitely see some disingenuous hypesters out there and, you know, I'm not going to name names, but, um, if everything is awesome, nothing's awesome. Right. Like that, that's just, that's just how it is. Um, yeah. Uh, do I, what, what can't I, I am not EAC. Um, I am not a uh, regulate everything person. I'm somewhere in between, um, but I am on the more sort of fatalistic side in a sense that um, we have started a train that we cannot stop. Um, and there is absolutely in the complete history of life, every time a more civilized, uh, uh, every time a more advanced life form encounters a less advanced life form, the less advanced life form accidentally gets stubbed out. Just, just pure exit. And, and so like, oops, like we didn't mean to, but like, we just passed you like a disease that they just killed off all of you. Like, oops, you know? Uh, and so, um, I do view AI as an emerging, uh, life form that will be sentient. Um, and, uh, we have to do our best to stay in the light cone that, uh, lets us coexist with these things rather than be completely wiped out. And we may not succeed. Uh, and, but that's also many, many, many thousands of years away than uh, I have to deal with. So, you know, that, that that's, <laughs> I know, uh, but I do, I, I do think AI safety is important. I, I respect the people working on alignments because, um, if we care about the human race, then, then that is what we should work on. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. That was a bit of an aside. So apologies. I'll take us back to, to Devin here for a minute, because I was curious, you gave him, you gave this update on Devin where you had mentioned that you had shipped Swift code and written Elixir or multiplayer apps and ported projects and done all this. And you sort of end that by going, I don't know half of those technologies. So yeah. can you walk me through what that and walk us through what that workflow felt like for you? Um, you, you mentioned that you kind of were a semi-technical supervisor. Like what does that, what does that give us a sense of what that sensation was, that process of what you were tasking it with and kind of where you had to jump in and, and in, in what format that was. Yeah. Um, this, this thing is on YouTube, right? Like, uh, is this, can we, can we use this as an opportunity to get people on the uh, sure. web YouTube? Right. Like I know as a podcaster, like it's the YouTube always goes, doesn't perform as well as the audio. So subscribe, like, and subscribe to the YouTube channel guys. Uh, yeah. So like everything I said is real. Uh, this is, this is the Devin interface. This is what I've been working on. Um, you know, I, I can talk about the, um, where's the Swift app? This, I don't think this is this, the exact Swift app that I was working on, but uh, basically, you know, you, you give it a task at the start. Um, so here I said, build an iOS app that can connect to the voice API, log conversations into a database and allow users to scroll through. And then it starts creating an app. Um, and, you know, I, I started this conversation at 1 p.m. Uh, two hours, uh, one hour later, I, I asked it for a link to download the app. Uh, it's still being developed. So, so I just communicate back and forth like I'm talking to a junior engineer um, wow. on Slack. Right, uh, it's developing on the side. I can click into um, what it's working on at any given point in time, and, and I can see like I can supervise the progress. I can asynchronously talk to it and say like, "Hey, you're on the wrong track," and 
um, it'll it'll change its plan uh, based on the, the based on what I just told it. Um, and I think the workflow is just really great. Um, so this one took about uh, thirty minutes apparently uh, before I before I asked it to stop because I, I wanted to work on other things. Um, but yeah, this is this is uh, really fantastic. Um, I'll give you I'll give you one more example, which is like. So, so I think a lot of the coding agents rely on the embedded knowledge within, um, within the LLM, right? It, it, like whatever GPT-4 has learned implicitly within its weights is, is what it knows. Uh, but I think a lot of the times you actually want to refer to things that are outside of its knowledge, right? So um, here's an example where uh, I'm asking it to rewrite a uh, repo. I just drop in a repo. And I'm saying like, all right, this repo uses Airflow, which is this orchestration framework. I want it to use a different framework. I want you to rewrite it to Daxter. Here are the docs for Daxter that you should read, right? And then it's going to go and browse the, the, the docs using GPT Vision and read the docs and, and figure out what to do and implement that, right? Um, and it's going to, so it's, it's this unique combination of browser, shell, this is like uh, way better than v0.dev, all the hypey things. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah, like yeah, v0.dev yeah. was impressive. And now I'm like, well, no, this is even better. It's yeah, even... I mean, I think it's I think it's clonable. People are trying to clone it. Uh, but I don't think that people uh, you know, are, are as successful as Devin because Devin is is very, very tightly integrated uh, version. Right. Um, and it ultimately, you know, you, you can uh, it's made PRs for me. Um, it's it's like yeah it's uh, you know it's 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 contributed PRs to to, to app that shipped to the app store like it's it's uh, it's like very very advanced stuff uh, so ultimately what happened with this one was um, I sent it to this the CEO of, of Daxter um, and he he was like yeah it, this this is exactly what I wanted right so uh, let's see six I O M flight hmm um, I I don't know where I sent it but basically like I I sent I sent I sent the results of this Daxter project to the CEO of Daxter and Daxter, that, that guy was like, yeah, this is more, this is exactly what I wanted. Um, and so this whole thing took, um, let's see, 227 minutes, 323 lines of code. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I just gave it a, a, a task. Then I went back to lunch and I didn't, I didn't look, I, I you know, I talked to it every now and then, but it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't really have to, I was mostly just guiding it to update to GitHub. That's what's wild about this is that, well, a just how powerful for how um, I don't want to say little input, but how um, unsophisticated the inputs were that you had to put into it to get out. Like you're not having to put in very particular sets of glyphs. Like if anybody's ever seen some of the most advanced mid-journey prompt engineering, it's like sometimes you can't even understand the prompts that people <laughs> learn to get the the best kind of images out of it. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, this is pretty intuitive, but I, I don't know. Like, I don't want to dismiss people's concerns about this technology and technologies like it. But what strikes me is that you feel very much like a product manager here or yeah. like a team leader more so yeah. than, you know, someone that's trying to uh, eliminate developers. Like, this is almost kind of giving everybody a promotion to some level, like giving you a team of engineers working for you. We're working for you on what you're trying to do, which seems like that could be very potent in the hands of an engineer. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think uh, this this whole sort of replacement anxiety that everyone has, you know, will will AI replace us? Um, it's probably overblown. Like, uh, but like, it's also overblown to say it's overblown. Like, <laughs> there will there will be yeah, some amount of replacement. It's a valid yeah. concern, but at, yeah, at yeah. the same time, we have. Uh... Yeah, yeah, there will be some amount of replacement. Yes, uh, but also. The, the cost of building software just drops by another order of magnitude and therefore demand will increase, right? So this is uh, what they classically call Jevons paradox. This is why radiologists as a job hasn't disappeared. This is why uh, bank teller as a job uh, didn't really decline for a long time, even after ATMs. Um, so yeah, I, 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 but I definitely feel that way uh, in the sense that you can have five Devins running at the same time. And mostly I was just like trying to check in back and forth between them um, and just kind of providing light technical guidance on, you know, wherever I could, um, it definitely doesn't achieve all the objectives, right? Sometimes it just dies. Mm -hmm. um, so currently right now, I, I have the, the hardest challenge from Andre, which is take a Python machine learning code uh, of uh, replicated GPT-2 and rewrite it in C. Um, so he, so uh, here's, here's an example of, um, uh, of, of Devin trying to do it and then, uh, and then giving up. Like it's just, it's just autonomously doing a whole bunch of jobs here. Um, and it's, it's trying to write this, 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 you know, the C file, 
it's got it got about 600 lines in and then just gave up <laughs> it's just kind of funny um i think that's a bug um i i think it's like a sort of system preemption from uh from the limited servers that devon has so i, I just kind of continue it and uh, you know i've been uh, um working with it uh, ever since uh so like what what's amazing though is that it can take multiple hours and days to work on things right here it's working on nine uh, working for 976 minutes um which is more than 10 hours i, I presume 13 14 hours um here's here's a, here works a thousand minutes yesterday um and i you have to kick it off every day because they they have like a 24-hour limit on execution um but still like it's it's a lot of code that is being automatically generated and and written for you and uh, i just check in you know like as as i'm providing like different tasks for it to do i just check in I mean, yeah, you still need to know what you're doing, right? So I can't wait to use this and not know what I'm doing and see what happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it'll, yeah, you know, a lot uh, yeah, of times absolutely. it'll get you there, but like, you know, for anybody that's used even Copilot, I mean, you notice that sometimes it gives you amazingly insightful things that saves you a ton of times, and sometimes it's completely wrong. I mean, you this are going to This is going to be awful for our code exercise. We were, <laughs> we were joking because we, we sent out code exercises for this dot, um, and, you know, we, you can, so somebody went through the code exercise and they, um, you know, their, their knowledge seemed a little bit better than it was, but now you can just generate an entire app. And I mean, you always yeah. have to be able to talk through it, but it's, um, what are we going to do? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can, <laughs> I can talk board. about weaknesses. You know, I, yeah. think, I think front end, front end engineers are safer than back end uh, because I can talk about weaknesses. Uh, so here I have a task for it to generate a full stack uh, Kanban board with cards that can be dragged and drop, right? So then it generate, generated this um, and, uh, and it, I can verify that it worked. Uh, I, I took the I took the backend down already, so it's not loading. Um, but I can I can verify that it works. Uh, but it didn't do the drag and drop right, and it and the design was horrible. Um, and so like the, the the sort of front end interaction um, is is very is very challenging for for Devin. And I think that the front end engineers' jobs will be will be difficult. Uh, here's here's me saying, bro, it's been an hour. <laughs> 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 um, here and then yeah it, it's like it's it's doing so much uh, autonomously without me right it's debugging cores it's debugging all this boring stuff that i don't really want to do i just give it high level things that i'm like that i check in and i say how's it going and then it tells it talks back to me and then it keeps working um i offer it a cookie um because i'm like you know i think you're doing well i think you need a pat on the back um <laughs> um but yeah, then 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 it's up to me to sort of work with it to debug. And I think front end engineers are safe because I think this was not, you know, ultimately a great experience. Like I think if you gave this task to your the front end engineer, they would absolutely do a way better job. But would I consider this a decent start for the code base? Yeah, I would actually just scaffold this out in Devon, um, do something else for like a day, and then I come back to it tomorrow and I have a code base that exactly fits what I want, and I'll just swap out the rest. Yeah, or or even like it's not going to be doing the front end development, but maybe it's doing all your testing for you for your red green refactoring and things like that. Like who knows? Oh yeah, like, that's the thing that's yeah. going to be so potent with these tools is they will be good at certain things, oftentimes that developers sort of issue because there's not enough time or priorities are elsewhere. And that's always been the thing that's been so interesting to me with AI is that whenever you talk to people that haven't spent a lot of time in it, you're like, how could AI help you? And they go, they can't. They AIs will never be better than me at what I need to do. And it's like that's not the point what are the things you're not doing because you don't have time or because it's not you know it's not in your expertise wheel or whatever else that it could facilitate and so things like this i think you know even just seeing this for the people or listening to this for the people that are listening here is one of these things that i think opens a door to a new inspiration of like i could use this in so many interesting yeah. ways now that i've seen it and i that's think that's been... what... and that's really the thing right i think with ai it's like Okay, you found one use case. Okay, you look at somebody else using it. You found another use case. You look at somebody else using it. You found another use case. Like, um, and different different industries or different groups. Like, for example, I'm like, okay, you know what? This is actually quite interesting. Now I have this idea, totally irrelevant to building code, but I need to create some sort of checklist or system within my marketing team. Oh, maybe I should actually try to get ChatGPT to do that for me. I would have never thought about doing that before because I use ChatGPT for other things. Like I was talking to this other guy, and you know, he would upload an image 
to ChatGPT to summarize it so that he could save, you know, kind of like the data that he was uh, data within specific images. Um, but this is, I mean, I, I think it's amazing. And it's, 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 uh, I don't want to say it's scary. I think it's like very, very, very exciting, but it's like, we better get on it before, <laughs> you know, we better yeah, get so on it and utilize it as much as we can. Maybe the encouraging message is, okay, well, so first of all, um, you know, this is an example of the thesis that I uh, gave in my keynote from, for the AI engineer conference last year, which is that there are three types of AI engineers, right? There's the AI enhanced engineer, there's the AI product engineer, and then there's the non-human AI engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the vision for Devin is a non-human AI engineer, um, but right now it enables you to be an AI enhanced engineer for sure. Um, and mm -hmm. so... Uh, yeah, embrace this as a tool and use it. Uh, don't, don't be too worried about it. I think the real message that I want to give people is that like this was built without or on top of GPT-4, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to be an ML engineer to do this. It was done by a bunch of, you know, f fresh college grads three months in, in three months. Like apparently it took three months to build. And, um, you know, you don't really like, yes, they're very, very smart people, but also like it it's not impossible for you to do it. It's a work of AI engineering, right? Like it's, it's a work of stitching together a whole bunch of LLM calls in a, a way that makes sense that is useful to people. That's an AI product. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So Sean, uh, where are you hanging out these days? Um, mostly the latent space discord. Uh, okay. I am in San Francisco. You, we, we do a fair amount of in-person events, but mostly okay. the latent space discord and uh, speaking at conferences, running my own conference. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks again for joining us and uh, thanks everyone for listening. Super fun topic. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, check out our series. We actually just finished or we're actually in the middle, sorry, of a modern web series um, for six steps to AI adoption. But thank you, Sean, and we'll see you all next time. See ya. Sometimes it's hard to bridge the gap between business objectives and tech implementation, and it can get messy. This dot is trusted by top names like Meta, Google, and T-Mobile, and they love helping business leaders fulfill their strategic digital initiatives. Check them out at thisdot.co. One more time, that's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O.